what I'm going to, what I will talk about today. Okay, so uh, I'm I'm Damon Morelli, and I'm going to today talk about the uh, evolutionary perspectives on learning structures. Okay, and I'm going to make a case. I'm going to argue for community charter schools. Okay, and I ask you to just take notes um, on uh, community charter schools. Community charter school is kind of that's my word. Okay. Um, so that you will not find community charter schools on the internet when you search for it. Um, so I'm using this word to represent basically charter schools that use what's called place-based education. Okay, they use a place-based education or uh, they also use experiential education. Okay, so a community charter school in this presentation, community charter school is a small scale You guys don't sit in the back, come sit up in the front. You're late. I'll take attendance. I'm taking attendance three times. I uh, won't do it just yet though. Okay. So community charter schools, small scale, place-based, experientially oriented charter schools. Does everyone know what a charter school is? Yeah. Hopefully. Okay. Charter schools, they receive public funding, but they operate independently. Okay? My use of community charter schools is that these are place-based schools, these are experiential education. Where's your pen? Come prepared, come on time. Okay, there's also what we call human scale education. And this is a movement, okay, it's an educational reform movement that promotes small learning environments, holistic well-being of learners, and self is anyone familiar with sociobiology? Okay, sociobiology kind of started with a gentleman named Edward, Edward O. Wilson. He's an evolutionary biologist. What we're doing is we're looking at social structures and social behavior using an evolutionary framework. Okay, so we're looking at behavior, our social systems, through an evolutionary framework. It's very associated with what's called evolutionary psychology. Okay, sociobiology. Today I'm arguing for a sociocognitive approach to education. Okay, sociocognitive is that understanding cognition, everyone knows of cognition, right? Inji, inji hata. Okay, understanding of cognition requires us to pay attention to the interconnected nature of social, biological, and cultural systems. Because in education, I feel that we don't. We don't think about the biology of learning and the social, the social elements of learning, okay? So my theoretical position today for this presentation, this is my theoretical position, is that renovating our educational systems, our educational structures to accommodate for the evolved sociocognitive nature or characteristics of learning and knowledge will allow us to facilitate real learning. Most of what happens in school is not real learning. Most of your preparations for tests, for tests, it does not represent or reflect real learning, okay, from an evolved socio-cognitive perspective. Also, I want to reduce mental distress in adolescents and in children. It's a big problem. I think all of you know this. And I want to improve the health of our local communities. And I think that our education system is very connected to, or, um, our education system uh, will play a very important role in helping us improve our communities. That's my theoretical position. My argument is that the priorities, the priorities of human scale education, as you've already written down, and small scale, place-based, experientially oriented charter schools, community charter schools, Okay, reflect a more socio-cognitively coherent educational approach. Ladies, ladies, come sit up here, please. If you'd like, come sit up in front. Okay, so my argument is that these small community charter schools better match how we really learn what real learning is. They really help us form real knowledge, not just shallow knowledge, but deep knowledge. I'll try to make that clear. OK? 
Okay, this is the outline that I will use for this presentation. What we will do is we will first we'll cover sections one, two, sections one and two first. We'll cover for about 20 minutes. We'll stop. Okay, we'll take a short break. Then we will cover sections three and four. We will, for about 20 minutes, we'll stop, we'll take a short break, and we'll then cover uh, section five and section six. Uh, I didn't really include a conclusion so much. Okay, I will take attendance at the start of each section. Okay, although I forgot to take attendance at the start of this section. So you will have to stay if you want to get your attendance score for today. Okay, so first we will focus on the emotional burden of school, the role of size and orientation of school. We will then, after that, look at myths of mind, learning, and knowledge, because there are many myths in our, for example, IQ. Okay, everyone believe in IQ? Yeah, it's not real. Okay, IQ is a myth that has, that has become part of our educational system and kind of part of our, of our general social knowledge. Is we believe that it's real, IQ is real. It's not real, okay? It's a myth that's perpetuated within our society and even by our educational system and by a lot of psychologists as well. Okay, we will then move into a combination of the sociobiological learner. There will be a lot of science, okay? I will try to make, I will try to make it simple. I will try. It's really difficult, I'll try to make it simple. I'll be covering a lot of science today, a lot of biology, uh, systems biology, which is systems, edom, um, things like that. And then we'll move in later to human scale education. And this is where we really focus on what it is to be human. Because our educational system, or the structure of our educational system is not currently, is not really, it's not structured around the individual, around the person around what it is to be a human living person. <clears throat> okay, so as you guys know, there is a big, a big burden to school, okay? And I'm going to suggest in this presentation that, that we can achieve equal or higher learning outcomes. We can actually achieve equal or higher learning outcomes while reducing the burden. <clears throat> This requires kind of a sociobiological understanding. Okay, so burden of school. One of the big burdens of school are mental disorders. Okay, we find mental disorders in many children and in many adolescents. Adolescents, the transition from being a child to being an adult. Okay, this is from. Uh, okay, many of these mental disorders manifest themselves in school age adolescents. So while Majority, majority of mental disorders are identified when children are in school age, okay, when they're in school. Uh, most all of them are diagnosed by mid-teens. So by the time a child is in their mid-teens, we have identified most mental disorders in our society, in our culture, have been identified. So it's occurring at a young age. Okay? Anxiety is the most common disorder with a median age onset of six years, Korean age seven or eight. Okay, this is when this is the average, not average, but the median. Everyone knows median, average, and then you get your average, and you're kind of counting it in. Median is kind of like the the point, anyway, in the middle. Okay, the median is six years of age for anxiety as a as a disorder. So there was a Jeju study, this is by professor, or researchers at this university, just a couple of years ago. They, they surveyed 2,305 elementary school students. They found that 17.3% exhibited mild depressive sy symptoms. That's almost one in every 20 students. So when you become teachers, most of you will have more than 20 students. You'll have 35 to 40 students, so you're looking at about one out of every, oh, I'm sorry, one out of every five, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, one out of every five, okay? So in a classroom of 35 to 40 students, you're going to have as many as five to 10 of your, well, five to 10 of your students will have mild depressive symptoms when you become teachers. This same study found 5.2% has severe depressive 
Severe depression. Okay, so one out of every 20 students of your students in the future, chances are that they will suffer from depression. Okay? There was a national study in the U.S. of 10,000 adolescents ages 13 to 18. They found that 31.9% suffered some classification of mental disorder. Now again, we're not, we do, there are many causes. Okay? There are many causes. There are many correlations associated with mental disorders. However, again, remember, most all of it come, becomes apparent at school, in school age. And it's interesting that, again, this six years of age, this is when students begin school. <laughs> it's a median onset. Okay. Psychopathology. Uh, this is just a fancy word for mental disorder. Okay. Mental problem, anxiety, and depression, particularly. Okay. One thing we have seen is that in the United States, there has been a huge rise in psychopathology and mental disorders, particularly among high school students, okay? Since, since the 1950s. 85% of school students, 85% of school students have anxiety and depression scores above the average score from the 1950s. So, we're looking at an average, right, here's your average, in the 1950s, 85% of high school students now in the United States have a score above the average. That's almost one standard deviation of a shift. One standard deviation, you guys know statistics, that's huge. That's a big shift in society of, men, of rates of mental, of mental illness in high school students. I'm sure it is higher in Korea. I'm positive about that. Okay, one of the things that we find that um, Tinge, a uh, research out of the United States found, was that the same time period of 19, from the 1950s to now, we've had a big rise in mental illness among high school students. At the same time, there's been a fall in play. There's been a rise in the amount of time that students spend in school. The amount of time students spend in our educational system, the amount of, has, has increased. The amount of time spent playing has decreased. And play is very important. Studies have shown that play is very important for a healthy emotional development and healthy social development. There's also been research that shows this in, in, this is in the United States from 1981 to 1997. The time spent at school by six to eight year olds increased 19%. The time spent on homework increased 145% over just a 17 year period. Again, I'm sure it's more in Korea. I bet that these rates are much more, have increased much more. So, now, we are not saying that this is causational. We're, I'm not saying, oh, more time in school means mental depression or anxiety. But, what was I saying? They are correlated. Does everyone understand correlated? Statistical correlation, is that you find? Um, you, uh, how many got, anyone? How many got correlation? We often measure with a correlation coefficient. Louder.
84% of students aged 12 to 18 years old reported being bullied over the course of the year. Notice, this is three out of every four students are being bullied at some point within the year. 79% of the bullying occurred on school property or in school transportation. This is a school problem. Most of it is occurring in school. I'm not saying it is because of school, but it's certainly connected. They are certainly related. There's some sort of relationship here. And bullying, and again, we're thinking about mental illness, okay, mental illness. Bullying has serious consequences for a person's emotional, psychological, healthy social development. Okay? Peer victimization, peer victimization, bullying, dogate, all right? Peer victimization leads to low school enjoyment, perceptions of school as unsafe, school avoidance, which means school, children don't go to school, they avoid school. Well, I guess that's absenteeism, I guess I wrote it twice. Okay, and then low academic achievement, and this is according to research by Card and Hodges. And not only that, it doesn't just affect the child when the child is a child. It affects the child or the adolescent going far into the future. Bullying has long-lasting consequences or ramifications. Bullying results in lasting behavioral, psychological, social relationship issues. Victims of bullying are significantly heightened risk for developing future emotional disorders such as depression, anxiety, and even suicidal ideation. And again, as I'm saying, bullying affects a person's mental health, and we do see that bullying is a school issue. And that we have seen increases of mental problems, mental disorders, as school has increased its role within our society over the last 50 years. This is kind of my, this is, this is the problem. Okay? And I think that the problem is that our schools kind of create an ecology, an ecology of bullying. Not purposefully, okay? Not purposefully, but kind of accidentally because of the structure. Let, one example I might use, uh, does anyone, anyone, uh, has anyone ever worked on a chicken farm? You ever worked on a chicken farm? No? They put many chickens inside small cages. Okay? Female, let's say female chickens. Okay? Now, female chickens, hens, are not really aggressive animals. They're pretty social. They get along reasonably well. Reasonably well. But when you put many chickens together, really close together, in a confined space, they start pecking at each other all the time. And in America, what we do is we cut off their beak. Okay? So in the big chicken farms, the female chickens, they don't have beaks. We cut off their beaks because they're always attacking each other. And they kill each other. Even though they're not naturally, naturally, they're not really that aggressive. Naturally, they're actually reasonably social. So according to Swearer and not, well, I can't pronounce Napolitano at all, the resulting social uh, the resulting social ecology of large schools nurtures bullying. In effect, the way school is organized contributes significantly to children's anxiety. And that's a position taken by uh, Mr. Wetz. There is an institutional failure in our educational system across the entire system, for the most part, across the entire system. The institutionalized educational structure fails to reconcile the evolved social needs. We are an evolved species over a long period of time. We are a social species. Being social is part of us. That's why today, after this class, you're going to go meet your friends for coffee or for beers. Because you are a social individual. It's part of who we are. Okay? And yet we never, we 
never take that into consideration in our educational structure and in our educational system. What we find is that there's actually the size of a school and the orientation, and this is kind of the philosophy, philosophical approach or the philosophy of the school actually affects students and affects learning outcomes greatly. Okay? One thing that we found in some interesting uh, research from the National Center of Education Statistics in the United States, one of the things that we found here was that non-sectarian private schools, okay? Does anyone know what non-sectarian means? Probably not, I'm guessing. Okay, private schools. Everyone knows private school, right? We have public schools, many public schools. We have private schools. Of private schools, many are religious, okay? Many religious private schools, and then we also have some that are non-religious. Non-religious. Often, for example, in Montessori, you guys know Montessori schools or Waldorf schools, for example. Okay. One thing we found was that these schools, these private, non-sectarian schools, had much lower rates of bullying. 37% lower than the closest private and non-private counterpart. Than the closest. Okay, so that means not the closest, their 37%, their rates of bullying were 37% less than the next closest, and then there are many more above that. Okay? So what is it about these private non-sectarian schools? Well, here are some of the, the a profile of a non-sectarian private school. Is that there is an orientation taken by the principals. There is a philosophy taken by the principals. They emphasize personal growth and self-esteem over academic outcomes. They do not stress academic outcomes. They don't say, you need to get good grades. They don't say that. What they say instead is they say, I want you to be happy. I want you to follow your passions. I want you to find what you love and do it and pursue your dream. Size. Less than 25% of non-sectarian private schools have enrollments more than 300 students. That means most of the schools are small. Most, 75% of the schools, are smaller than 300 students. And for many of these schools, that include, many of these schools are combined uh, elementary school, middle school, and high school together. Elementary school, middle school, high school together, not more than 300 students. So these are smaller schools. They have average student to teacher, teacher ratios of around 10.1. I bet you hope that you will have that kind of student-to-teacher ratio when you become a teacher, yeah? Only 10 students instead of having 35 or maybe 40 students. One of the outcomes, now again, remember, the principals, they don't stress academic outcomes. The principals, they say, hey, I want you to follow your passions. I want you to find your loves. And yet, look at this, they get a 98% average graduation rate. And this is in the United States, okay? Oh, sorry, accident. Okay, all right, so they're able to achieve high academic outcomes without stressing academics. One of the things that we have found, research has found, is that the size of a school is very connected with academic performance. Schools that are larger have lower graduation rates. This is well established. Okay? School size is particularly correlated, again, correlate, correlated, correlation coefficient, correlated with dropout rates. Larger schools, higher dropout rates. More students quit school. Okay? Lee and Burkham posit that smaller schools, smaller school sizes, result in social conditions that
that inhibit dropping out. Is that the social ecology, the social ecology of smaller schools results in kind of social dynamics that prevent students from quitting. Uh, one of the reasons that they, I'm, I'm going mostly from memory, but they say that, that, that this includes um, like organizational trust, members' commitment to a common purpose, more frequent contact with people who share difficulties, sharing difficulties, uncertainties, and ambitions. I'll, I'll skip that part. Okay, so this is the problem. We're going to stop. We're going to take a quick break. I will then take attendance. When we come back, and we'll start again. Okay?